Welcome, my beautiful people, to another episode of Dino Basics, where we dig up the basics on some of our favorite deceased beasts. My name is Logan, and today we explore the basics on one of the last children of the dinosaur lineage. But while other dynasties went out with a bit of a whimper, our focus is certainly anything but that. It's the hadrosaur of a thousand different names, the Edmontosaurus. The history of Edmontosaurus, like many from the late 1800s, is a somewhat complicated and confusing one. Technically, the first specimen of Edmontosaurus would be discovered in 1892 by American paleontologist Othniel Charles Marsh, who recovered the remains from the Lance Formation in the modern U.S. state of Wyoming. Upon its discovery, Marsh would select the name Cleosaurus anectens. But following his death only a few years later, this pre-Edmontosaurus specimen would be juggled between a variety of hadrosaur genera. You see, while crested hadrosaurs were easy to tell apart from one another due to the ornate and distinct shape of their crests, the crestless hadrosaurs were more commonly mixed up and confused with one another, with the most defining difference between individuals early on being whether they had a duck-billed mouth or not. This led to broad, loosely defined genus of hadrosaur dinosaurs to be created to group these specimens together, with common examples being the Trachodon and Thespesius. The name Edmontosaurus would not come into use until about 1917, coined by paleontologist Lawrence Lambie, based on two partial skeletons discovered in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation in the Canadian province of Alberta. While other remains that would go on to be assigned to Edmontosaurus were also discovered in this same formation around the same time, they would instead be assigned, once again, to the Thespesius genera of hadrosaurs. But not for long. In 1942, a new genus of hadrosaur was created to try and resolve the complicated taxonomy of crestless hadrosaurs by grouping together many of these more loosely defined genera. Among them, the now-defunct Cleosaurus, Thespesius, and Trachodon, among others. This new dinosaur would be called the Anatosaurus, sometimes nicknamed the Classic Duck-Billed Dinosaur. Classic might have been a bit too honest, as in a classic move from many hadrosaurs before, it would lead to confusion. The type specimen of Anatosaurus was found to likely be a specimen of Edmontosaurus, and in 1990, the genus was broken up. Of the three species for Anatosaurus, two were moved under a new species of Edmontosaurus based off of that specimen from all the way back in 1892, called Anectins. And one was considered distinct enough to warrant a new genus of dinosaur altogether, the Anatotitan which only lasted about 20 years before rejoining its buddies under the Edmontosaurus name. Aside from a mind-melting history, the Edmontosaurus has had other important events in its history. Two obvious additions would be the discovery of so-called dinosaur mummy specimens, one in 1908 and the second in 1910. Now, mummy obviously draws images of bandage-wrapped corpses from Egyptian tombs, but this clearly isn't the case for dinosaurs, although the two do have some similarities. Dinosaur mummies, as first noted by paleontologist Henry Fairfield Osborne, who coined the term to describe one of these Edmontosaurus skeletons, describes a specimen that is exceptionally well-preserved, usually including some amount of preserved skin, muscles, or tendons. This is not to say these corpses were actually mummified, as the term is often used informally, but it likely did undergo similar conditions in the mummification process, such as an absence of oxygen due to rapid burial, or having the carcass dry out of moisture before burial. As for the name Edmontosaurus, only half has a true translation, that half obviously being the Greek word soros for lizard. Edmonto is a reference to the Edmonton Formation, the Canadian formation the first specimen that would go under the Edmontosaurus name was discovered. As of today, two species names are still widely recognized for Edmontosaurus, Regalis, 
first named by Lambie in 1917, and Anectins, created after the dissolution of the Anatosaurus genus. Regalis can be translated directly to regal from Latin, but can loosely be translated to mean king-sized. This translation better hits the mark, as it was named to denote its larger size when compared to other known hadrosaurs for the time. Anectins also translates from Latin, and means connecting or linking. This name originates from the original Cleosaurus specimens, discovered by Marsh in the late 1800s, and was chosen as he believed this new genus of hadrosaur could represent a link between more primitive and derived duck-billed dinosaurs, based on what he believed were transitional features present on the fossil. This name was brought over to Edmontosaurus more due to naming conventions, rather than any believed link between generations of hadrosaurs. As I have given away by now, the Edmontosaurus is a member of the Hadrosauridae family of dinosaurs. The Hadrosaurs were an extremely successful group of herbivores whose ancestors would first appear in the late Jurassic to the early Cretaceous, and by the late Cretaceous had diversified to nearly every corner of the globe and become some of the most successful dinosaurs of all time. As I had alluded to, Hadrosaurs are often split into two main subfamilies. The Lambiosaurs, informally referred to as crested hadrosaurs, are most easily identifiable for their distinct hollowed head crests, likely used in differentiating one another from a distance, as well as creating unique sounds for long distance communication. Sorlofins, inversely, can sometimes be called crestless hadrosaurs, although this is a bit oversimplified. While many Sorolophins lacked any kind of crest, some would sport a short, simple crest usually made out of flesh and skin. While others, like the namesake Sorolophus, would have a bony crest, it was made of solid bone and lacked any kind of hollow openings for vocalization. When it comes to analyzing the Edmontosaurus moving forward, we will largely be focusing on the Regalis species. Both Ergalus and Anectins are superficially very similar, with the most significant differences being Regalus being considered the larger of the two, different distributions across North America, as well as Regalus sporting a short, comb-like crest towards the back of the skull, while Anectins had no such feature. Regardless of species, Edmontosaurus is considered one of the largest hadrosaurs to ever exist. Estimates believe Edmontosaurus could reach lengths of about 40 feet, or 12 meters, and stand at about 12 feet, or 4 meters tall, when in a quadrupedal stance. Owing to their heavily built bodies, estimates believe Edmontosaurus would weigh nearly 4 tons at full size. Their skulls were nearly just as impressive, reaching an average length of 3 feet, or a meter in length. The general profile is often described as triangular in shape, generally narrowing as the skull moved towards the end of their mouths. Members of the Regalis species would sport a short, comb-like crests towards the back of their skulls, and unlike Lambiosaurs like Parasaurolophus, these would be made of skin and flesh rather than bone growing out of the skull. It likely was used strictly for display or for differentiating individuals in a herd. Analysis of the eyes for Edmontosaurus revealed the creature likely had binocular vision to some degree, where their eyes would more face forward and create a single three-dimensional view of what is in front of them, and made excellent for depth perception. This trait is actually highly... Alright, buddy, kind of staring into my soul there. C can we go into another image? Thank you. Unusual for herbivores. Often, herbivores will express more obvious adaptations towards monocular vision, which is not as effective at depth perception, but provides a wider view of the world around them, which is better for noticing predators from a greater number of directions. Exactly why this is the case in Edmontosaurus is currently unknown, although an interesting observation regarding this notes how young Edmontosaurus have been discovered to have a more monocular-based vision, possibly hinting that different aged and sized Edmontosaurus may have had different priorities in vision. 
As a small calf, they would want to see as much as possible and run at the slightest hint of danger. While a fully grown Edmontosaurus may value the information of depth perception, telling them if they should stand and fight or run if they are too small or their soon to be neck gnar is a bit too close. While duck build is a common phrase used with Edmontosaurus and many other hadrosaurs, much of this so-called duck bill would be composed of flesh and bone, with only the last few inches towards the end forming any kind of keratinous beak. Early interpretations of Edmontosaurus and many other hadrosaurs believed their food preferences were actually very similar to that of a duck, eating an assortment of soft aquatic vegetation in shallow lagoons or lakes. But analysis of microware for the teeth of Edmontosaurus reveal it was more likely a grazer, using the large surface area of their mouths to scoop up large amounts of vegetation, and possibly cropping their jaws to strip branches of their nutritious leaves. To help process these large amounts of food, Edmontosaurus would sport grinding, flattened teeth towards the back of their jaws, arranged in a column-like structure to ensure teeth could be quickly replaced as they are worn down. By some estimates, while Edmontosaurus would only be actively chewing with a few dozen teeth at one point, above each tooth would be a maximum of six teeth in a dental battery meaning an adult could have hundreds of teeth in their mouths at one time. This efficient chewing system is sometimes attributed to why hadrosaurs were able to become so widespread and successful by the end of the Cretaceous. Edmontosaurus's arrangement of teeth, combined with other small adaptations like unique chewing methods that allowed for multi-directional chewing and possibly a more efficient digestion system, helped the hadrosaurs become some of the most sophisticated plant processors for their time, helping them grow faster from helpless calves to enormous bruisers, and ensure the preservation of their species. Behind their skulls, their forelimbs were fairly well built, but comparably much smaller than their hind limbs. For this reason, it was likely Edmontosaurus was what is called a faculative biped, meaning that while they would more often trot or rest on all fours, they would be able to rear onto and move on their hind limbs for defense or to run at greater speeds. Despite its large size, some have argued that Montosaurus was actually fairly fast, able to run at speeds of up to 28 miles or 45 kilometers per hour. Although some dispute this high speed, and others even argue they would more likely gallop at a high speed rather than running bipedally at all. The Edmontosaurus was believed to have lived during the late Cretaceous, living up to the Cretaceous extinction event about 66 million years ago. Fossil evidence indicates Edmontosaurus would have lived across much of North America, with direct evidence showing areas of southern Canada and western U.S. states like Wyoming. Much of the region during this time would be comprised of coastal plains and lush forests, although regions farther north would see more temperate and even frigid conditions. This era of North America is really a who's who of classic dinosaurs, home to some of the most famous and iconic beasts of all time. Some of these include the well-armored walking tank and Kylosaurus, equipped with their powerful club tail, easily capable of crushing bone the hard-headed Pachycephalosaurus, wielding their distinctive domed heads, reaching a thickness of nearly 10 inches or 25 centimeters of pure bone at their thickest, the three-horned Triceratops, usually considered the most common large dinosaur of their time and ecosystem from Colorado to Saskatchewan, their bitter rival, the bone-crushing Tyrannosaurus rex, wielding teeth as long as one foot or 30 centimeters in length. And, uh, oh yeah, um, I'm gonna go with Craig. Yeah, yeah, we all love Craig. He's, he, he's the best. By most estimates, the Edmontosaurus at full size would be one of the largest animals of their ecosystem, even outgrowing Tyrannosaurus rex by a few feet in length and height, and by some estimates, larger Edmontosaurs could even be twice the weight of the largest Tyrannosaurs, 
although these are more often outliers rather than the norm. It is well known T. rex would be the most direct threat for an adult Edmontosaurus, with even some fossils of Edmontosaurus showing direct evidence of predation based on damaged vertebrae. But the media can often exaggerate how helpless Edmontosaurus would be in such situations. While it lacked a horned face or a club tail, wielding an average weight of 8 tons of mass, an Edmontosaurus could easily dislocate or break the bones of a careless T-Rex. And in the cutthroat prehistoric wilds, this could easily be a death sentence. For this reason, it has been proposed an adult T-Rex would ideally try to isolate younger or weaker individuals, or hunt in pairs to ambush an unaware adult. To minimize such threats, it is likely a Montosaurus would live in large herds to have more eyes for spotting would-be predators, as well as have more bodies to protect young in the event of an attack. While Edmontosaurus lacked a significant crest for communication, some have suggested Edmontosaurus may have had inflatable air sacs near the nostrils based on deep indentations around the bone. Although this is still very speculative. Another common speculation based on Edmontosaurus trackways and fossilized footprints is that Edmontosaurus was a migratory animal traveling possibly as far north as Alaska, and moving as far south as southern Alberta. A round trip that would be around 1,600 miles, or 2,600 kilometers in length. This migration would be necessary in the temperate Canadian wilds, where Edmontosaurus would have to follow the changing seasons, as certain areas would become too cold to support the abundant amount of food they needed to survive. Despite lacking the eye-catching crests of many other hadrosaurs like the Parasaurolophus or Corythosaurus, the Edmontosaurus today is still one of the most common and famous hadrosaurs in modern media, making numerous appearances in films, television, video games, and plenty of others. Due to its long history, some have referred to it using older names, like 1999's documentary Walking with Dinosaurs, and 2001's When Dinosaurs Roamed America, using the now defunct Anato Titan. But others have provided its current designation, including documentaries like 2011's March of the Dinosaurs, 2022's Prehistoric Planet, 2023's Life on Our Planet, and 2025's iteration of Walking with Dinosaurs as well as video games like 2019's Jurassic World Evolution and its eventual sequels, and in 2022's Prehistoric Kingdom. And these are just to name a few. The Edmont... Craig, get out of here. Wait for your episode in like 2028. <clears throat> the Edmontosaurus has become an icon among dinosaurs not just for its many depictions in modern media, but also its significance in the study of paleontology. Its remains, from the fragmentary to the mummified, have provided us some of the most detailed looks into the final days of the dinosaurs, and revealed insights related to one of the most diverse members of the dinosaur empire. It certainly is not an exaggeration to point out just how Ed monumental this dinosaur has been for the casual and academic alike. That's good to do for this episode. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to leave a comment below what you think of Edmontosaurus and if you've heard of this dinosaur before the video. There are always certain dinosaurs where even before I write a single line for the script, I think, oh boy, this is going to be a long one. And this one certainly did not disappoint. Next week, we cover a dinosaur that, quite frankly, I know no one has asked for, but I really want to talk about. The Liaoningosaurus. If you want to be absolutely baffled next week, just don't look up that name and go into next week's episode blind. Thank you for your support, and see you in the next video.